Okay. It says we're live now. <laughs> All right, but are we live for real? This time? I know. I'll Let's try to refresh the page and see what happens before we we uh, launch in. Yes. Yes, I see us. We're there. Yes. Okay, so we're live. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's try again. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Kelly Bone, and I'm here with Jessica Fisher from the um, Parenting Reset podcast, <laughs> as well as Kara Rose from the um, She's Raw Paw Adventures on our Facebook group. And um, Kara is one of our canine nutritionists that does online consults for a fee. And we were going to have them talk to you today about how to do raw feeding and how to transition to raw because so, so, so many of you are scared of how to do that. Um, the reason why you think this is so critical right now is for those of you who've been following this for a couple months, you probably have noticed that I've changed our pet food recommendation graphics and we've changed them and they no longer say that they're recommended. They just say that here's the list of human grade foods. And the reason why we think it's so important for you to feed human grade foods versus pet feed grade ingredients right now is because from the foods that we've seen pets getting sick from, they all seem to be feed grade ingredients. And so we really feel that it's important that you feed human grade foods. Having said that though, none of us have been to every factory and every manufacturer to see how they manufacture their food. And so it's difficult to say that they're really following the processes and that they're not using certain chemicals or pesticides or anything like that in their factories. And so, that's why we're not recommending a food anymore. We're just saying, here's the list of human grade foods. These are probably safer than the pet feed ingredients that you'll find in Purina and Merrick and For Health and Diamond and things like that. However, we truly feel that the safest thing for you to do is to do a uh, raw or gently, um, gently cooked diet. And so that's what Jessica and Kara are gonna talk to you about today is how to transition to that if you choose to do so. Um, we will... Um, uh, write down any questions that you have. If it's related to this video, then they'll answer them on the spot as we go. If you have other things that you wanna ask um, towards the end, you can go ahead and ask it and we'll try to get it in. But we do have a hard stop at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yes, and I do see a bunch of y'all pouring in here. Thank you so much for being here. Do comment, um, any, any comments, any questions you have. We'll be able to see them. <clears throat> and as we're going through, um, I do want to apologize, though, because Facebook made some updates in the past couple of weeks with the um, external connections to groups. So we can't see your names. We can only see Facebook users. Um, and that's just a privacy setting that Facebook has set up with groups specifically. So if we don't say your name, it, please don't take offense. <laughs> Or you can write your name in the comments if you want to do that. But, yeah, it yes. just everything says Facebook user, but we're really happy that you're got you um, that you're that you're here, that you're interested in this information, um, and thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak to all of all of these wonderful people in your um, Facebook group, Kelly. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Somebody said the video is freezing, so they're going to try it on their computer i'm assuming they're on their phone so hopefully it's something just on one person's end and not us um, yeah but yeah so i think um we could probably just dive in and just let, let it flow as it goes so the first thing that we wanted to talk about was transition um and we'll talk about dogs and we will also talk about our lovely cat friends uh, of whom Jess and I both have um, and I think everybody across the board knows are a little bit more difficult in all aspects of life but especially when it comes to food uh, so we'll definitely talk about both and if you hear galloping that's one of my cats running back and forth across the room <laughs> um, so transitioning uh, can be easy or it can be difficult I think that Across the board, I've never heard anybody say they had a 100%, you know, no hiccups, no loose stool, no dog refusing, you know, sweet as pie transition, uh, my own dogs included. And so I think one of the first things that I can say about transition before we even go into how to do it is making sure that you have a positive attitude about it and understanding that you may encounter some bumps in the road and that's perfectly fine. And preparedness is going to 
really be what uh, allows you to get to where you're going uh, more easily uh, rather than being reactive. I think preparedness is very important. Unfortunately, when I transitioned, I was a lot more reactive. <laughs> it was a few years ago and I was not quite there uh, in all the aspects that I needed to be. And so it made things a little bit tougher, especially since I have three dogs that I was doing all at the same time. So it was a, it was a really interesting couple of weeks for us. Um, so Jess, what are some things that you think would be a good idea to have on hand for pet parents who are wanting to, trans just to transition their pets to fresh food? I think some of the most basic things we can have on hand are going to be um, canned pumpkin or cooked sweet potato. Um, these are going to add fiber that are going to help kind of ease things, push things through the digestive system. Um, slippery elm, marshmallow root, those are wonderful to have on hand at all times anyway, because you just never know what's going to happen um, from day to day. But we can also, I'm, a, and I know Kara is too, really big on functional foods. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, we, we got our nutrition certifications from the same place. So we have like a lot of the same like educational background, which is wonderful. Um, so using food therapy and everything we do. So I love having bone broth is really wonderful for um, digestive upset. It's really, really gentle on the digestive system. Um, and also things like kefir, like that is some, like one of nature's best probiotics. It's just a fermented milk, preferably a goat's milk. And it's so nutritious, but it's also like the, the natural probiotics that you get from fermenting it are really wonderful for gut health. So those are some of like the basics I think we can have on hand to help our dog and our dogs and our cats really transition. Do you have any that you like in addition or like you prefer over one or the other? <laughs> Those are definitely the big ones on my list as well. And um, for anybody who is like me and called Kefir Kefir for their entire life, that's what Jess is talking about. <laughs> but that's the correct, the actual way to say Kefir. Um, no, I agree. And like uh, what's nice is a lot of those things you can make yourself. So if you're anything like me, um, and you get a little bit weirded out by things that are in cans, you can go make your own pumpkin puree. Um, it's actually really easy. And then that way you get the seeds too, because you can toast them up and give them to the dogs or use them for yourself. Um, bone broth I'm making constantly and you can add superfoods to it. And I, I love that today. I just happened to be listening to your podcast and you um, interviewed crude carnivore and I have some of their bone broth. Um, I normally don't buy it, but I saw it on the shelf and was intrigued. So. A lot of these things you can make yourself, which is nice because it offsets the cost of, of feeding fresh food, which admittedly is more expensive than kibble because um, it's real. Uh, but I agree. I think that those are really good things to, oh, Liza says that my audio isn't great. I will turn it up all the way and hopefully that helps. And if it remains poor, let me know and I can always switch to my phone. Yeah, you're, um, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I, I get too. Okay, I can always be louder. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I would say that those are at the top of my list for sure. Um, so diving into a transition, I know that some people are very uncomfortable with the prospect of completely stopping one food and then completely starting a new food. Um, and I've had a lot of people say that they uh, like to do, you know, the 25% rule where you take out 25% of the kibble and add in 25% fresh, do that for a few days, and then you go to 50-50. Um, right now with everything that's going on, especially, I would not have that high on my list of ways to transition. Uh, what I like to recommend to people, and I've done it, I did it with my own dogs, and I've done it with a lot of clients, is cold stop do a 24 hour fast as long as it's not a puppy um, and then ease into just a, a lean meat it could be a grind that's lean or it could be you know like a chunked meat like beef chop or something like that uh, with a bone so that you're getting your your bone content which helps firm up the stool um, and just moving slowly up from there is how i i tend to recommend people doing it and if you have a dog who you know is a particularly sensitive gi tract then adding one new food at a time if you're doing DIY is one of the best ways to make sure that, you know, are they tolerating that food? 
Um, you know, did they all of a sudden they develop diarrhea? Okay, is it because they're kind of detoxing and getting some of the toxins and crap that's in kibble out of their body and that's why their stools look mucousy and gross? Or is it because you gave them a food that perhaps they don't tolerate very well? They may have a sensitivity to that food after being on kibble for a few years. So that's why I like introducing one food at a time. And I tend to work with a lot of dogs with allergies, so that's what works best for me. Yeah, and I think it is important to, like, I have done it both ways. When I first transitioned the two dogs I had at the time when I was, like, learning about fresh food, I did do it, like, really slowly over a long period of time, not because I was being really intentional about it, but because I was learning. And I knew my shortcomings, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing yet. And even though I asked my veterinarian at the time, he was just like, I don't know, you're doing all right, I guess. <laughs> and um, so I like I knew I had to do it, do it and figure it out on my own. So I went really slow and I kept that kibble base because I'm like, oh, they need they need, you know, in my mind, they need this balanced food. They need this balanced food. So like I kept that kibble base and kept just trying and playing around with different foods, adding in until I got comfortable enough that I'm like, OK, we're transitioning fully to a fresh food diet. And it went really, really smoothly with them, probably because I did it over such a long period of time. But even like my dog now, the day I adopted her, cold turkey, we just she was eating kibble at the rescue. She's no longer eating kibble now that she lives with me. And she did really wonderfully on it. So it's not, um, you know, every dog is different. Every dog is going to be different. And it really does depend, like Kara said, like how much does their body need to detox? And understanding that diarrhea isn't all bad. Like we don't want to see it. As pet parents, we're like, oh my gosh, my dog has diarrhea. Like we freak out. But the reality is that like vomit and diarrhea, like they're, that's the body's way of getting something out that shouldn't be there. So our like knee jerk reaction is to stop the diarrhea. What can I give to stop the diarrhea? But in reality, like sometimes there are things in the body that need to come out. And if we give them something to stop the diarrhea, then we're not letting whatever that is, you know, get get removed, <laughs> to be removed from the body. So that's yeah. one of the things that I was I was telling Kara, I really wanted to try to get across to everybody today is like, don't freak out over every little bout of diarrhea. Yeah, if it goes on for three days and you can't get a handle on it and it's only getting worse, absolutely. We need to probably consult our veterinarian and, and do something, but things happen and like it happens to us too, right? Like we, we know that um, it's just our body doing what it's supposed to do and trying to get all the gunk out. So don't freak out, please, over every little bout of diarrhea. <laughs> and, and Jessica, I think one of the things that we're that we've been kind of harping on in the group is if you have a pet who's been sick, especially with one of these foods that are possibly toxic, um, you know, one of the things that we're recommending is that you just stop the food immediately, do a bland diet for 24, yeah. 36 hours, do the pet food toxicity um, detox that Dr. Judy's recommended, and you want to do all of those um, products not just one or two. You want to try to do as many of them as you can. And then go ahead and start introducing, like Kara and Jessica are saying, start introducing the other food. And if they start getting a little sick, you introduce some, you know, canned pumpkins, some marshmallow root, some slippery um. There's ways to manage it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are things out there, like there are medicines and things that, you know, I can tell you just from working in human, human medicine that you can give to people, which is the actual anti-diarrheals, right? They stop the spasms. That's not quite what you're looking to do when you have a dog who's like getting off of kibble and detoxing, or maybe you did a diet change and they have some inflammation. The things that we're recommending, like giving the bone broth, giving the goat's milk, um, you know, are for hydration and replenishment. And then you have slippery elm, which helps decrease inflammation in the GI tract. You have pumpkin, which acts as fiber. So it's not that you're giving something to just stop diarrhea in its tracks. You are mm -hmm. giving natural products to allow the body to work with itself and what it's supposed to do to firm up the stools as opposed to giving them something that is like an actual anti-diarrheal type of medicine that's what's preferred um you know and like the things that you see that you can kind of tell that dogs are doing a detox is that those kind of 
mucusy looking stools. Like I feel like anybody who's transitioned a dog knows exactly what that looks like. It's not pretty. Uh, it's not nice to scoop up and put into a poop bag, but, but we all know what that looks like. Um, one thing that I would like to mention too, and a lot of people I've actually been seeing this a lot on the page is people are, um, some people are concerned about like, I see a lot of people saying, I want to feed, um, uh, freeze dried raw, excuse me. And I want to feed fresh raw food. Um, can I feed those together? And I see some people saying like, no, they're digested, um, you know, at different periods of time and you need like this one takes longer. And if you feed them together, it can cause a blockage. That's not true. There's no evidence to suggest that that is the case. Um, and, you know, I, I, people have been feeding them together or separate or a mix of anything really that they want to do for a long time without any issues. So I just wanted to, I've seen that like four or five times over the past couple of days. So I just wanted to address that really quickly. Yeah. And the um, talking about that, what you were saying, Kelly, if they do get sick to do a, 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 I like to do a fast and then a um, bland diet, but a lot of times I'll do a modified fast. So mm -hmm. I'll give like a bone broth. Mm -hmm. So they are still getting nutrients from the bone broth. They're getting all of that wonderful collagen and the, um, the broth itself is, is really soothing to the digestive tract. Um, and healing to the digestive tract. So uh, I, uh, depending on the dog and the age of the dog, anywhere from like 12 to 24 hours of a fast with a with a bone broth, just offering it, you know, random, I don't want to say randomly, every few hours throughout the day um, can be really, really helpful. And then that that bland diet and then talking about a bland diet, I, I do not like chicken and rice. And I know that it's something you guys post all the time too. Please don't just do chicken and rice. <laughs> I don't love feeding rice to dogs in general. Like there's just no, pretty much no need for it. Like I hate to say, like never say never because every food has some sort of um, property to it that can be beneficial in various situations. When we look at like, say, traditional Chinese medicine, every food has different properties that we can look at and, and try to incorporate at some point in time. But if we're just talking about like a bland, please don't feed chicken and rice to your dog. My preference, and I don't know about you, Kara, my preference is either like cooking up some ground turkey with a little bit of pumpkin puree or um, cooked sweet potato. Yeah. And that's my go-to bland diet. What, what, what's yours? Uh, the same, um, and you know, I'll even say like I years ago before I even realized that I should be feeding my dog a species appropriate diet back way back when when he was suffering from pancreatitis, when I would feed him chicken and rice, he would get worse. So he'd have a pancreatitis flare, and then I would cook up a crap ton of rice for my poor dog who was suffering from pancreatitis because of the carbs in his food, and I would hand him a big bowl of more carbs, and he would get worse. And that was when I first realized that rice is a very, very poor choice for dogs with an upset GI tract. So instead I would do chicken and cottage cheese, which was just a, recommended by a friend. And that worked way better for him because dogs are built to digest fats way better than carbs. And so don't feed rice, just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, and um, the, a lot, there was a lot of questions, and I think Dr. Josie Bugue kind of chimed in, so thank you so much, um, about like what kind of bones to use, and you absolutely can use any bones to make bone broth, um, and I think she was saying that she just like throws them in the freezer until she gets enough to make a batch, which is wonderful, but the more um, collagen-rich bones that you have, you have like big marrow bones, if you have feet have a ton of collagen in them. Like those are going to make like really, really yummy, like gelatin like broths yeah. the more the longer you cook them. So um those those are gonna be really wonderful. But yeah, you can absolutely like use anything. Any and all that. <laughs> yeah, anything. Just as long as you carefully strain it. You know, like I've used necks yeah. and stuff before and you get the tiny little vertebrae, you just have to be careful that you're straining it all out. But yeah, you can use Yeah, that. absolutely. So. Yeah. So I, I personally think dogs are fairly easy to transition. Um, even though like there are all these rules, like you were saying, 
do 25% at first and then give it a couple of days and then increase. And if you're, if that's what you're most comfortable with, go ahead. Um, but again, like if everybody, as, as everybody else in this group has been saying, if you're feeding a kibble a, and if your dog has any sort of symptoms um, of illness that you believe is from the kibble that they're on or they're refusing to eat it, like listen to your pet and just yes. stop. Just yes. stop. Yes. It's to going, in, in my opinion, it is it's so much better to deal with a few days of diarrhea than what could potentially be going on from what we don't know yet is whatever is happening with these kibble products. Yeah, severe illness, some death. I mean, I will, I will take diarrhea any day. So <laughs> right. Uh, so all right. So should we talk about our beloved cats? Cats transitioning cats. Yes. <laughs> My cats admittedly have taken me a really long time, like a really long time. But I will say that getting them from kibble to higher quality foods, canned foods and freeze dried foods, that was the easiest part. Like what's taking me the longest is actually trying to get them to a raw food diet. But that was the easiest, quickest part. Um, and I always like to start with stop free feeding and go to meal feeding. Yeah. For dogs for me, too, dogs too, just time. to put that out there. A lot of people do free feeding for dogs and it's, it's yeah, the, one of the I worst for, things that you can do. Yeah, I forget they still do that with dogs. <laughs> yes, 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 but cats, yes, I agree. Stopping the free feeding before you even try to change their food and getting them used to, this is your meal time and this is what you're gonna eat. And if you don't eat it now, I'm taking it away and you're getting it later is one of the first things and most important steps, I agree. Yeah, and the thing with cats is that, uh, well, a few things. They are not small dogs and they will starve themselves. A dog, they're not gonna starve themselves. That's why, one of the reasons why I think it is so much easier to transition a dog, they're gonna get hungry enough that they're gonna eat whatever you're giving them to eat but a cat will starve themselves. And that is not a pretty place to be if you find yourself in the veterinarian's office because your cat hasn't eaten in three days and they're lethargic. And then your vet is telling you, you have to force feed your cat. And now all, all you're doing is imagining the, the blood all over you <laughs> from trying yeah. to force feed your cat. <laughs> the yeah. 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 yeah, I agree. And dehydration, I mean, it's cats already are su at such high risk for living in a state of dehydration and developing severe kidney disease. And then when they go on a, a hunger strike, it's even scarier. And that was how yeah. my cat's transition started was I thought that I could do them like the dogs and just slap a bowl of new food in front of them. And they didn't eat for days. And I got so scared because I have yeah. some old, you know, I have some old men and uh, I got so scared that I was like, Oh, and I, and I went back to kibble immediately. Cause I was like, well, but they do fine on this. And it took me, it, I was scared. It took another month for me to try again yeah. and realize that I had to go slow, but yeah. I similarly had the experience that it was easiest to switch them their dry, crunchy kibble to dry, crunchy, freeze dry, because mm -hmm. part of the problem with cats is that they imprint on food at a young age. And so they get used to the crunch of kibble. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention all of the synthetic additives and flavoring sprayed all over it, but that crunch is actually becomes addictive to them and it's hard to overcome. And so I had the most success switching them to a freeze dried food first. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, freeze dried food is the most expensive food. So even for cats who are tiny, it's not very sustainable if you have a lot of cats. And so even having three, that was a lot of money for me. So um, you know, moving them away from that and toward DIY is my ultimate goal that I still have not met, but I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah, the same thing happened with me when I, and at the time I had eight cats Oof. that I was trying to transition at one. I'm trying to remember back when I was trying to transition them. Um, and it was tough because I actually had, I want to say about six of them took really well to canned food. I'm like, okay, let's get them from kibble to canned food. And six of the eight did really well with that. And two of them were like not having it. So I did what you did. And I found a, um, a flash 
freeze dried, cold freeze dried um, food that had that crunch. And the other two were like, okay, we'll eat this. And even though I wanted to rehydrate it, I didn't because it was giving them that crunch. And then in that process of them accepting the like crunchy freeze dried food, they were kind of like, for lack of a better term, like detoxing from the high starchy carbohydrate load that was in the kibble. And then it made it easier for me to transition them to the wet food. And, um, over the years, I have increased the quality of the, the wet food that I have given them. And th then through the years, started slowly adding in various raw foods. And I think for cats, it's easiest to start with just a chicken breast. Is I mean, yeah. just something really inexpensive. You probably already have some that you bought at the grocery, you know, your last grocery trip for, you know, fixing something for your pet, I'm sorry, for your family. And just take a tiny little sliver of it and kind of chop it up and put a little bit in their wet food and see what happens. A lot of cats will just run right through and eat it. And you're like, oh man, that is so cool. Like that is the coolest feeling when your cat just eats something you give them. <laughs> Yeah. The, the feeling of success is just yeah. It's like you, it's like you won an Olympic uh, gold medal. But yeah, I I agree. The, the the tiniest bit at a time because cats are naturally suspicious, um, mm -hmm. and so they wanna they want to see everything you're doing. They want to sniff everything you're doing. You know, they're gonna sniff their food. Their olfactory senses are off the the rails, and they're gonna smell it and say, "Well, this doesn't." this isn't my normal food. Are you trying to poison me? Um, and so that, that tiny, and you know, I forgot what I was listening to. It might've been you, Jess, where somebody was talking about um, putting the new food, not even mixing it yet, but putting the yeah. new food in a bowl next to the other bowl. So they recognize the smell is in the area and mm -hmm. the new food, that it's food because it's in a dish that they eat out of, even though you didn't try to give it to them and letting them choose what to eat, but getting used to the smell and, and um, view of it uh, and mm -hmm. then slowly starting to mix it in, which I only yes. heard about that the other day, but I think that's a genius idea. Yeah, that's actually something that um, Julianne Thorne talks about. So she has, uh, her business is Naturally Cats and um, she talks about the two plate method with cats because they, like Kara was saying, like the food that they start eating when they're young, it like imprints on them. Like this is food, right? So they think kibble is food. And then when you try to present them with something that's actual real food, they're like, that's not food, that's not food. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so that two plate method is just putting that real food in the vicinity of what they currently associate as food. And then they start to create the association that, okay, th this is continuously here while I'm eating in this space with my food on this plate that I normally eat off of, it, it's food too. They start to like associate that. Um, and that works for some cats. And then other cats, it works to put a little bit in their food. So you really have to kind of try it out because every cat is going to be different. And, and what Kara said at the beginning, like patience, having realistic expectations, don't beat yourself up too badly. <laughs> like if it's not going the way that you had hoped it would go, I've spent many nights on the floor crying <laughs> with my cats. <laughs> yeah. Like, why is this happening? Why can't we get this done? I get it. I've been there. Um, be like kind to yourself and to your cats and you'll, you'll get there, especially, you know, take some of the tips that people like Kara have and who've been through it and try them out with your cats. And yeah, there are, um, just some way, you know, cat, again, cats will starve themselves. So that is one thing I want if, if nobody else remembers anything else from today is like cats are not dogs so we do need to treat them differently but again 
if they're sick from what they're currently eating, we, we really got to try hard, hard, hard to get them transitioned to something else. Even if we're doing, um, uh, one thing that I did with my cats a while back, I used to make um, like DIY churus. So I would uh, boil up some chicken breast, take that chicken breast, put it in a blender with some of the water that I boiled the chicken breast in and blend it up. And I would put it in little um, baby food pouches <laughs> and squeeze it out for them. And they loved it. But at least that's real food that you're feeding to your cat. And um, but like it seemed like a treat to them. So, I mean, literally with our cats, it's it, it's like a whatever we can do situation sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, every cat is going to be different. And so, yeah, just the best you can do is your best. So, and I saw somebody had mentioned in here, you know, please talk about the importance of dental health for cats. It is just as important as it is for dogs, honestly, if not more, because cats are stoic and they will not show you that they're in pain. Um, and cats can be prone to resorptive disease. Um, so it doesn't even have to just be like your regular dental disease. It can be like a resorption issue at the bone level that you don't see. So if you ever have a cat who all of a sudden stops eating um, or seems, you know, like they used to like to be petted on the head or under the chin and all of a sudden they don't want you to touch them, please go get a dental exam because they didn't have a, a big issue. And, and, Two of my cats are fighting. I'm so They're sorry. fighting. I, 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 you did, didn't you? That's an uh, yeah, unmistakable sound. Um, yes, fatty liver disease is what your veterinarian will call it when you take your cat into the vet because they've been starving themselves. They're, they're, the liver actually like starts to turn into, I, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not going to describe it well, but it's like the liver starts to like turn into more fat. It's it's gross the way my veterinarian described it to me. I didn't ever want my cat to have to go through that. Um, yeah, okay. If they don't eat, their livers can be flooded with fat and they spiral into liver failure. Yes, that is exactly what my, I, I feel like that, again, it's just telling us Facebook users, so I don't know who is posting that, but if it's Dr. Josie Bug, <laughs> I, I can see her um, telling us that. Um, and also it's really uh, important, I think, since they were asking about dental health for cats, for cats and dogs, by the way, it is 100% a myth that you will lose teeth. It absolutely does not. In fact, it is more detrimental for your pet's dental health than anything else because of all of the starchy carbohydrates that are in it. It, the, the starch like breaks down and literally like binds to the teeth at the gum line. And it, it's, it, it's horrible for your pet's dental health. I don't know. It was some really, really wonderful marketing tactic many, many decades ago and people can't seem to shake it, but it's absolutely false. Literally last night before I went to bed, I answered somebody who said that I keep a little kibble on the diet to clean their teeth. And I, <sighs> yeah. <laughs> and I went into probably way more detailed of an answer than I needed to about salivary amylase and what's a biofilm. And then I hit enter and was like, I'm not even going to read what I wrote. Yeah, they, needed, they needed crunch in the middle of the night, they said. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, so don't, um, don't, yeah, it's really bad for teeth. It's actually a, the number one cause of dental decay in dogs and cats. Yes. Number one. So, yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, transitioning your cats slower, even like if, again, if they're sick, change the food first and foremost. And if we can feed them, even like, again, it's temporary to feed them just a single protein, right? We don't ever want to say, just start feeding them turkey or chicken and they're going to be fine. But like, that's not true. Um, but temporarily to transition them to, them to something else, sure cook up a chicken breast and let them go to town because most cats love that. Um, and at least they're getting some nutrients from some food <laughs> as you're figuring out what to do along the way. And somebody else talked about rotating. Absolutely, we want you to rotate. I don't care what you're feeding, you should 100% be rotating um, brands, uh, recipes, proteins, rotate any and everything. If you're giving supplements to your pet, we should be rotating those as well. 
like we we never want to see you feed or give the same thing to your pet forever. That is just asking bueno. for trouble. Yeah. And so that seems like a, probably a really good way to slide into balance. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about balance. Yeah. So rotating is a great way to balance. So balance over time. Um, so you're going to see a lot of people talking about balance over time. I mean, there's books, there's podcasts, there's interviews, there's everything. Um, you, it's up to you, you know, how frequently you want to switch out those proteins. Um, I've seen people say every three to four days they do a, no, a new protein. I've seen people say, you know, once a week they, they rotate in a new protein. But, you know, there's infinite options to choose from, from excuse me. And there are a lot of really great online calculators um, that you can do where you plug in your the dog's age, weight, and activity level. Um, and then it will tell you, feed this much bone, this much meat, this much organ, this much, you know, veg, fruit, seed, or whatever, if that's what you're doing. Or my personal favorite is the Feed Real calculator, feedreal.com slash calculator, because it has the ancestral option, and I'm a huge lover of fish in the diet. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, using that, and you literally just plug and play, you know, it's like today I'm doing duck feet with, you know, beef chuck, uh, lamb organs, I have uh, some mussels for manganese and I grabbed, you know, spinach and arugula out of my garden and that was my vegetable. And then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe five days from them, you are going to use pork ribs and you're going to give chicken, you know, uh, chicken breast and some oysters for zinc and you got some um, Swiss chard and, you know, mushrooms from the store for your vegetable, you know, so like as long as you are rotating it through just like humans who don't eat the same thing every day, um, then you're going to achieve that balance over time, just making sure that you are hitting four to five more, if you can, uh, different proteins, um, animal proteins and vegetable proteins. So balance over time is a really great option for people who have the resources uh, to do that. And also, and I, I hate to make it about money, but sometimes the money to do that, because if you are rotating frequently, um, that usually means you're buying in smaller quantities. And when you buy family packs of things or large batches of things at you know wholesale stores and things like that, it tends to be a little bit more cost affordable um, as opposed to buying like the single pound of this or the two pound pack of that, which generally does have unfortunately a slightly higher price tag. Yeah, and it, I think it's also really important too to know yourself and know what you are going to do and what you're gonna follow through with because um, I absolutely love the balance over time and the rotating. And even, even if you know you're the kind of person that is not going to follow through with that, um, and you need a balanced recipe to feed your pet so that you know, you're, you feel comfortable that they're getting everything that they need, still get more than one recipe and rotate those recipes. Um, for, so I was thinking of this person saying, I was thinking of making four to five different pup loaves, switching the ground through beef, chicken, pork, turkey, lamb. Yeah, and, and that's wonderful. There are a lot of recipes that you can find online. Some of them are balanced, some of them are not. So as long as you're rotating and you know that you have some form of calcium and the calcium phosphorus ratio is relatively balanced. Um, hopefully you're feeding raw meaty bones, but also I know that not every dog is going to eat raw meaty bones. Um, in fact, I have a dog who is a princess that will not eat raw meaty bones. So I have to balance in other ways um, if I'm going to do DIY. Oftentimes I don't just because that's where I am in life. The reality is, and I don't care what we're talking, I don't care if we're talking about dog food or if we're talking about cleaning your house you're either going to have to put money into it or you're gonna to have to put time into it. We don't get other options. Those are the only two options we have. <laughs> you gotta put money into it or you gotta put time into it. So um, you gotta figure that out first. Where are you at in the state, in your, you know, whatever stage of life you're in, can you put money into it and buy a, you know, a pre-made raw that is balanced to meet minimum APCO requirements, which you know, I, personally, and I, I think Kara agrees with me, I don't think is fair for fresh foods, but that's, you know, that's what we have. So that's what we have to live with. Um, that's a, that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> um, but whether you're doing that or you're saying, I don't have the money, I'm going to put the time in to making meals for my pet, then please rotate your recipes. Please, please, please rotate your recipes. Um, you're going to get so like, I, you're going to feel so much better about providing a really well-rounded um, nutrient profile to your dog over time if you're doing that. Bones are one of the best ways to get. And and I think, is it Dr. Billinghurst? Said, he might be the one that says that like even a raw meaty bone is like, that's a wonderful diet in itself. Like that's pretty close to it's not going to be AFCO balance, but like what we're looking for as far as giving, giving our pup all the nutrients they need. Um, I think he was the one that said that. Uh, so that's wonderful. Um, making sure that there is organ meat somewhere in there, please, please, please. <laughs> um, because the reality is that the world we live in, our muscle meats aren't as nutritious as they used to be 100 years ago. So we're getting the bulk of the nutrients are coming from that raw meaty bone and the organs. So if you're foregoing those and you're only feeding muscle meat and vegetables, there's a lot missing from that diet. Yeah, I agree. Soil so depletion, I mean, it goes all the way down to, to the level of the soil and the ground that the grass is growing out of that the cows are eating that are yeah. not on a regenerative farm. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kelly, there's a question. Yeah, where's the best place to find recipes that are balanced online? Also, we've heard mention of a calculator and how, um, oops, just moved. And how do we determine the percentage of different things? And is there a good place to go and learn about them? So as far as recipes are concerned, if you go under featured, we have a whole post full of a zillion recipes. They're from the Forever Dog, Dr. Judy, Dr. Loudon, you name it. There's a lot of recipes there. So just go under featured and look for that post. There's also a, a different post that Kara helped us on which is um, a post that tells you about, I think it's got six or seven different um, classes you can take on nutrition. And you can go there and you can sign up for anywhere from, I, I believe the cheapest is like $79 to a $499 class, but you can take a very good nutrition class and learn everything you, you know, to really get you off to a good start. Um, how about the calculators, you guys? Where can they find those? The feeding calculators. It's, somebody up above said, could you please like post the, or like type out, it's it's just feedreel.com slash calculator. So and I'm sure we can just type it into the comments after the video. So mm -hmm. that's my favorite one because it has the ancestral one, which includes mm -hmm. fish. I think, does Primal Pooch have a calculator? Oh, I'm not, my, the other one I like to use is at Perfectly Rawsome. Yeah, yeah. That, per, sorry, Perfectly yeah. Rawsome. Yeah, Ronnie, Ronnie has one, yeah. Yeah, that Ronnie, Ronnie Lejeune. Um, yeah, those are the pretty much the only two I like because there are other ones out there and I just haven't. But, yeah, you can Google yeah. it, but I think some of them make it seem more difficult than it is. Um, but so yeah, those are the two that I have looked at myself. Um, and then somebody had mentioned, I was thinking of making four or five different pup loaves and switching between the different grinds. So I, I think Jess, you started reading that one. I think that's a great start. I wouldn't feed that forever. So you, the way, you know, pup loaf is, is formulated to be balanced by using the ingredients that are in it. And so you can switch out the meat, the meat proteins, but you should also be rotating vegetable proteins. So you don't want to feed only spinach every day forever, right? You want to switch out your greens, dandelion greens, um, you know, arugula, uh, Swiss chard, collard greens, kale, like there's so many different ones. And so if that's what you're relying on, that if you like swap those out, that would make Pupple of no longer be balanced because of the way that it is formulated with intent. Um, so it's a good start, and I think you should definitely do that, but I would feed more than just that if that's what you're planning on doing. Um, so I think maybe let's talk a little bit now about daily balanced recipes as opposed to balanced mm -hmm. over time. So I love I love the idea of balance over time. I am not at a place in my life where I can balance over time. Uh, I work a full-time job. I have a business. I help out, you know, on different pages like the Saving Pets page, and I have three dogs and three cats. So not only can I only afford to buy in bulk, um, I also just don't have the time to prep different things three times a week. So I do one big meal prep once a month for my dogs. And so I'm making usually two different meals to feed during that prep 
but both of them are balanced. Uh, because I, I just can't do balance over time right now. I know myself, it just doesn't fit in with my schedule. And so I feed a balance daily. So it's similar to if you're buying a balanced pre-made grind or, you know, um, I think there's a term that exists out there that is, I, I don't know exactly what people call it, but like spreadsheet, spreadsheet feeders. Um, do I think every meal needs to be fed off a spreadsheet? No. But do I appreciate that there are people who need to feed a balanced food daily because for whatever reason, which are not my reasons to judge, they can't do balance over time. And those are the people that do need assistance from a program such as the pet diet designer. Um, I like to, I actually don't like pet diet designer, I'm sorry, animal <laughs> diet formulator. I actually hate PDD. Um, so things like animal diet formulator, yes, I think there's a time and a place for those. Um, you know, and I'm, it's, I'm glad that there are programs now that you, we are kind of putting out people that are getting certified in nutrition um, because we can help people with that. So if you can balance over time, I think that's amazing and admirable and I love it because I love variety and keeping things interesting. But if you can't, like many people, including myself, can't, there is a time and a place for creating a balanced diet daily. Yeah, especially I think um, for dogs that have a lot of food sensitivities, um, yeah. we can get to we can get to a point where we just can't put enough rotation in yet because we have to work on the gut um, so that we can get back to a point where we can add in add back in more foods and, and rotate more foods. Um, but there, yeah, certainly are going to be instances where, and then again, I, I was talking to Kara the other day, I, you know, you have to know yourself. I definitely have clients that they're just like, give me a recipe. That's uh, just give me a recipe. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to give you a recipe, I'm going to give you at least three recipes because you have to at least rotate the recipes I give you. Right. <laughs> like I, you know, yeah. if you know yourself well enough to know, you're not going to go out and source all of these ingredients to keep this rotation going for your pet because it, not everybody is in that season of life. Right. And some people will never be in that season of life, but the, you still want to have a pet and that's great. That's wonderful. Pets add so much value to our lives. Please do give that pet a good home. Um, then please rotate at least three balanced recipes, at least three balanced recipes yeah. um, if you're gonna do it on your own. Um, and somebody was asking about veggies as well because yeah, dogs, um, we, we do wanna either blend, like somehow break down that cell wall or steam the veggies. Um, even if you're feeding please. a raw food diet, please do like, Throw, throw those veggies in a blender or steam them or something to break down that cell wall before you feed them. Um, it is gonna be much, much, much better on your dog's digestive tract and pancreas and all the things. <laughs> yeah, otherwise you might see that cranberry come out the same way it went in. Yeah. Which is yes. <laughs> Um, And I know we don't have a ton more time. I did wanna just kind of throw out there because I have seen a lot of people there are two different things that I've seen so much of in the group that um, it just wasn't feasible for us to talk about today, but I'm absolutely willing to come back and, and talk more about it. Um, one is animals that are on a prescription diet and you're scared. You're like, okay, what am I gonna do because my dog or my cat needs this prescription diet and what am I supposed to do now? Um, there's a lot of misinformation about prescription diets. And again, we're not going to be able to cover that today, but if that's something you're interested in having us talk about, I'm more than happy to come back and talk about those as well. And then so many dogs with food allergies and or sensitivities, um, that it's, it, it's rampant. And again, it's not a, like everybody wants a, tell me what other kibble I can give my dog. There isn't another kibble you can give your dog. I'm sorry. But also a lot of, well, what supplement can I give to make this go away? There is no supplement you can give to make this go away. So I think a lot more needs to be talked about on that. And again, I'm happy to like come back and talk about those things. So, but I want you guys to know that we, we hear you, we understand what you're going through. We know how difficult this is and we really do want to be here to support you the best way we can. 
I agree. I think those are really important parts, and I they could have their own video. But I will say, I've been doing a little bit of digging because I'm going to be um, presenting a PowerPoint actually uh, in a week or so at a store in Sacramento. But prescription diets are crap. It's the exact same food that's in a bag of kibble. They just slap the word prescription on it. Uh, you know, and this was this was the answer to the health issues that started with kibble. So kibble started in, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then all of a sudden, 70s and 80s, dogs are starting to get sick and owners are reporting these health issues. So what was the answer to that? Oh, owners are coming in with dogs that have health issues after eating our kibble, let's make prescription diets. So it was made to solve a problem that was created by the original problem itself, which, you know, and if we do a separate video on it, I am more than happy to talk about the years that my dog struggled with pancreatitis while on a low fat prescription diet that made his pancreatitis worse. So yes. I agree. That's, yes. uh, that's a video in and of itself. It is for sure. And I know, um, so there's a, a pet summit coming up. I hope this is okay to say Kelly, there's a pet summit coming up in April um, that I uh, recorded a presentation for on using a rotation and elimination diet to help dogs with food sensitivities and allergies. So um, if you're already like signed up and you're on the list for pet summits, you should see that, you know, the sign up for that coming out soon. Um, but that could also be helpful in the meantime for people who have dogs with allergies and sensitivities. I think that's a great idea because I can't, I mean, so many, I, re I can't go one single day without seeing well, my dog's allergic to this, or I did a glacier yeah. peak, or I did a five strand, and they can't eat anything. What do I do? You know, yeah. so it's it's scary and it's really intimidating. But I will tell you that fresh food is the answer to your problems. Yeah. So, one hundred percent. Five minutes left. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, uh, but I also want to say that is very important. Fresh food is, um, I don't, I've, so many people have said it at this point, food is like the safest form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Um, so that is absolutely the foundation of, of health. Sometimes we do have to do more than that. Like I, I do, I don't want people to get trapped into this like, okay, feeding my raw food diet, feeding my dog a raw food diet is going to fix like all the world's problems. And then they feed their dog a raw food diet and like, yeah, they're doing better, but it hasn't fixed everything. And that don't like get discouraged. That's like, we're setting up the foundation and there, there are dogs who need more help than that. So I don't want people to get like sucked into like, oh, just feeding a raw food diet is going to cure everything. Like that's, mm -hmm not what we're saying here, um, but it is going to set up a really healthy foundation, any sort of fresh food diet that you're feeding, whether it's raw or gently cooked. Um, because look, if you're uncomfortable with eating a raw food diet, please feed a gently cooked diet. I, I'm here for you, please do that. <laughs> um, I, and just know that like some animals need more support, especially, you know, if they have some sort of illness or disease that they are are living with we there's there's a lot that can be done but food is the foundation of health and jessica i think one of the things we see in our group a lot a, a, a tremendous amount is you know they'll say oh my my dog's been eating hill science diet or they've been eating carina or diamond or, or one of those and they have uti problems they got kidney infections they've got um really itchy skin they're on apoquel or cytopoint well, it took a long time for them to get that bad, and it's going to take a long yes. take you quite a, quite a while for it to get better too. But mm -hmm. a raw or gently cooked diet is the first step to healing that dog. And usually, what we find is give it about ninety days, and all of a sudden you start reaping the benefits. You start seeing things turn around, and you know you get them off some of those yucky medications like Cytopoint or Apoquel, which are very dangerous. And you'll start seeing their their coats coming back they're not itching as much they're not having ear infections um food is medicine it is and you know you have some really incredible holistic veterinarians um on the back end of this facebook group as well providing some wonderful information just i mean listen to them please <laughs> Okay, uh, so we have yeah. just a couple minutes left. I yeah. see a couple comments in here I wanted to address. So one is um, somebody said you can change the chemical properties when you cook meat or organs, it breaks down the taurine. So I just want to clarify that there's a difference between gently cooked and cooking the ever crap out of something. 
So you are not trying to take the ground beef, put it in the pan, and cook it until it's got that, you know, like that hard char on both sides and it's cooked all the way through. It's, you're popping it maybe in the oven, cooking at a low temperature for 10 or 20 minutes, and then taking it out and it's still rare in the middle. It's gently cooked to a temperature that kills most bacteria, which I think is like 135 degrees. Yeah, it's pretty low. It's not yeah. too much, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that's, and, and then you're serving it. You're not cooking it until it's burnt and brown like a, a ball of kibble. Um, so can you lose some nutrients in the heating and cooking process? Yes, mostly B vitamins um, tend to be very fragile and those will get, some of that will get lost in the cooking process. But for the most part, your amino acids, which your protein breaks down into amino acids and those amino acids include taurine, they, they do not, it does not get destroyed by a gently cooking process. It's the extruded, repeatedly cooked at high temperatures and then pounded to a mush and then cooked again process of kibble that, that gets rid of the taurine that can lead to danger. So gently cooked still retains the majority of nutrients. Gently cooked. Yes, absolutely. Um, and let's see, oh, somebody, this was actually something we had talked about yesterday too, Kara. Um, talk to, so your vet is telling you to talk to a vet nutritionist. I'm telling you from my clients telling me vet nutritionists are like six to eight months booked out. Um, there are so few of them and God bless them. They're, they do a wonderful job. The All the ones I have seen still use a lot of synthetics in their um, recipes, yes. if you're comfortable yeah, with that. It you're comfortable with that. There are um, uh, other nutritionists that are not necessarily veterinary nutritionists um, that go through different sorts of programs like Kara and I did that can uh, also uh, provide you balance without using synthetics. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, you're, if your vet is asking you to have whatever you're currently feeding, um, test it out to see if it is balanced, that that's a service that can be offered as well. I know Kara mentioned it earlier, the animal diet formulator. It's something you can buy as a pet parent. Um, I use it too, to, to create recipes for people who want every meal to be balanced for their pet. And um, uh, yeah, you can test out whatever recipe you have to see if it is deficient in anything or maybe an excess of something you don't want to be in excess because yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. possible too. Yeah. And I mean, you can plug it in, right? Like you can plug it yeah. into the formulator and it'll say, yeah, not mm -hmm. just like a send out to a lab analysis, but just plug it in. It'll right. tell you. Um, right. But yeah, I agree. And um, unfortunately, if it's not, a, if you are looking for a vet nutritionist, I would definitely try and look for an integrative or holistic vet nutritionist. Mm -hmm. I have a client right now who had come to me who was seeing a couple of different vet nutritionists and their dog with IBD was on a constant carb source. They went from white rice to brown rice to potatoes through these vet nutritionists. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that conventional veterinary medicine does put a big emphasis on kibble and, and grains and things like that. And so you want to make sure that if you are going to pay them the money to work with you, that it's going to be up to, you know, what your standards are and if it's with your ideals and if you know, they match mine, which are to avoid grain in the diet um, and rice in the diet and to not use synthetics or supplements like the Balance It website, which I despise, um, you know, then you just want to make sure that that's not what they're going to give you after you pay them, admittedly, probably more money than what non-veterinary nutritionists charge. Okay. Now, also, just to remind everybody, we have um, four vet nutritionists in our group. We've got Jessica. Uh, we've got Kara, and Kara goes by Raw Paw Adventures if you want to book an, book an appointment with her. We've got the Wholesome Dog, and then we also have Lisa Mayer, um, and we also have Dulcie's, uh, Dulcie's Legacy. Yeah. So Lisa's is uh, KK's, KK's Paws for Wellness and Health, and then yeah, yeah Dulcie's Legacy is Raw okay. So we, we have five. Yeah. Is that five or four? Five. Five. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's, a bunch, there's a bunch of us. We exist. <laughs> yeah yeah so um as far as getting more recipes so uh, um somebody just mentioned and i think you uh, uh, is probably i'm sure just a mistake we're we are all certified nutritionists um none of us are veterinarians 
Um, but there are veterinarians, holistic veterinarians, who are providing support to the group in other ways. Um, okay. Jessica, we, the nine holistic vets that we have also do online consults for a fee. So that's under the featured tab. Um, also, the canine nutritionist, we have the list there of the canine nutritionist, so you can go there and they do them for a fee. Somebody asked who specializes in pancreatitis for a, a vet or for a nutritionist. Really, any of them could um, help you with the pancreatitis. Um, yeah. And if you have a dog with cancer, you really want to see Dulcie's legacy. Yes, yes, you brought one. Absolutely. Um, I know you have a hard stop, Kara. Um, Sorry, guys, I have to work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but this was awesome. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for all of the comments and questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but um, hopefully this was helpful and informative and you'll be able to come back to it. Um, if, you, if you didn't get to watch all of it, it'll be in the group. And uh, yeah. Anything closing, Kelly? Yeah, and we'll answer to someone said, I know we didn't get to everything, but all of our moderators and admins will go into the comments and answer things for you, and we'll post the graphics of the vets and the nutritionists for you. Yes. Awesome. And then if, you, if anybody else have, has any other topics that you would like to see as videos, please let us know. We'd be happy to put some together. Um, you know, we've got uh, Jessica who can help host them, and then also the Wholesome Dog. She does a lot of videos, and so we'll pull them together and pull in the right um, – subject matter experts as appropriate. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Kelly. I want to be on the prescription prescription diet one since Doug Duggan died from it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I know. Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, I mean there's so much misinformation. Um, so if we can help to spell it, that would yeah. be great. <laughs> All right. Well thank you everybody for attending. We appreciate it. Have a nice day. And this will be um, put underneath the featured uh, yeah underneath the featured tab. We'll go ahead and tag it so you guys can find it and uh, go ahead and post it in your groups as well. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.